So uh, thank you, Silvia, for the introduction. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, although it's uh, virtual, and uh, and also happy to open uh, this workshop. And um, today I'm going to tell you something about the project that I recently wrapped up at MIT. And uh, as Silvia said, it's, uh, uh, it's trying to find the links between available resources and microbial community diversity. But before digging into the results, I want to give you some motivation. So the motivations that uh, frame this project. So as Jacopo said before, we live in a really diverse world. And um, so life on Earth has evolved in a variety of uh, mesmer uh, in a mesmerizing, mesmerizing variety of forms. And uh, of all these forms, I would say that the most ancient and the most abundant is not depicted in this drawing because it's invisible to the naked eye. And indeed, it is represented by bacteria. So bacteria colonize every corner of the planet from the most extreme environments like deserts, uh, geothermal areas, and hydrothermal vents uh, to our body. And microbes perform crucial, crucial functions, both for our health and for the health of all these ecosystems. Indeed, microbes are involved in the cycling of nutrients, in the uh, fixation of carbon dioxide, and also in the production of oxygen. But uh, microbes are not only super abundant and extremely ancient, but they're also very diverse. And to give you some numbers, I can tell you that the total diversity of microbes, uh, it, it, it has been estimated to be about uh, between 0.8 to 1.6 million of uh, uh, prokaryotic species. And it's not only global diversity that is impressive, it is also a local diversity that is uh, uh, quite impressive as well. So, uh, for example, communities, microbial communities that live in our gut can host between 500 to 1000 uh, species. And even more impressive, a single grain of soil, a gram of soil more or less, can be home to uh, between 100 and 1, and 1 million bacteria species. So I would say that uh, one of the most important questions that we as microbial ecologists are trying to answer is actually, how can we explain this uh, uh, microbial community diversity? And let's say that the question of how can we explain uh, species coexistence has been around for quite some time. So in 1961, Hutchinson uh, published this, uh, a paper that then became famous and which is entitled The Paradox of the Plankton. So Hutchinson was wondering, uh, how is it possible that uh, an environment that, like the ocean that is so poor of resources could harbor so many different species of plankton? Indeed, this was a puzzle because ecological theory says that equilibrium at, at equilibrium, the number of species cannot exceed the number of available resources. And indeed, when we think about diversity, we usually think about available resources. And going back to microbial communities, when we think about the heterotrophic bacteria, they usually compete for sources of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus that they can find in their environment. And here I'm just providing some examples of what's on their menu. So like you, we can find com, uh, compounds like glucose, which are simple sugars, but also complex polymers like cellulose and also disaccharides and amino acids. Well, and there is a large uh, series of a large variety of models that predict that if I provide just one of these compounds, let's say, for example, glucose as a source of carbon, and let's say that there are two species that compete and can use that can use this resource and compete for it, then for the principle of competitive exclusion, uh, just one species is going to survive at equilibrium. And it's usually the species that has the highest growth rate. But actually, when scientists started performing these experiments, realized that if they provide just glucose as a source of carbon, then they could see many species coexisting. And if, let's say, the growth environment uh, is not, uh, doesn't present uh, uh, spatial heterogeneity or variation in time of some parameters, then one of the possible explanations of the coexistence of, of so many species with one resource is a phenomenon that is known as cross-feeding. Uh, so with cross-feeding, we mean the process by which, uh, well, 
microbes grow in their environment and start producing metabolites that can leak in the, in the environment surrounding the cells. And these metabolites can become nutrients that other community members can use to grow. And um, so we learned, and these uh, experiments have tried some different carbon sources, not only glucose, but some amino acids and also some polysaccharides. And we learned, we learned a lot about cross-feeding and species coexistence with, ex with experiments with just one carbon source. But in their natural environment, microbes are exposed to, uh, um, let's say, pool of resources that, varies in the, that vary in their size and also in their composition. So what we exactly tried to ask in this project is whether we can link the availability of carbon sources and specifically the number of resources and the type of these resources that are present in the environment with the community diversity. So, and in trying to answer this question, today I'm going to show you that in our experiments, we see that there are many, sing many compounds that when provided at single resources, they sustain remarkably rich community. And we think that this is due to uh, cross-feeding. I will, also, I will also show you that when these resources are combined, very surprisingly, diversity increases on the, only modestly. And um, then I will show you that we think we can understand this pattern. Uh, and uh, I will show you that we just introducing uh, resource uh, utilization strategies and meaning the presence of generalists and specialists in our communities in a lockable Terra model, we are able to reproduce our experimental results. Um, so before digging into uh, the results, I'm going to uh, briefly tell you something about uh, our experimental protocols. So we started with the soil sample, and I actually collected this soil from the lawn in front of our building at MIT. I didn't go very far. And um, back in the lab, I mechanically detached the bacterial cells from the grain of soil to obtain a, a dense microbial suspension. And, we'll, and to give you an idea of the diversity of this microbial suspension, we had more than 700 species. So I used this diverse suspension to inoculate 75 different resource environments. And so to create these resource environments, I started with a pool of 16 carbon sources. And if you are interested, all these resources are quite abundant in the soil and they include simple sugars like glucose, but also disaccharides, um, organic acids like citrate and also some polymers. And um, all these compounds could be provided either as a, sing as a single source of carbon or in combination of two, four, 15 and all the 16 resources together. And we kept the total concentration of carbon constant across all these uh, different conditions. And um, so to grow the bacteria, we adopted a daily dilution protocol, which means that uh, at the end of every uh, 24 hour growth cycle, we um, took a small amount of the bacterial culture and we inoculated it into fresh media. And we followed this protocol for seven days and at the end of the seven days, we um, extracted the DNA. And uh, um, thanks to 16S RNA amplicon sequencing, sequencing, we could get the composition of uh, the communities. So maybe this is uh, a good time to stop for a second. And maybe if you have questions regarding the experimental protocol, um, let me know if there are any questions. I, I actually do. <clears throat> I actually do have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that these resources are all, I think you may even said abundant in the soil. Mm -hmm. um, somebody just like went into the soil and did mass spec uh, on it, something or like these organic acids uh, detection. And what is the thinking that like, where do they, is there one resource that sort of gets in and then all the others are byproducts of microbial metabolism? Or is it just uh, like decaying plant matter? Where does where does nutrient appear from in the soil? Sorry, this is a super naive question, but no, no, it's not naive. It's actually a good question. So, uh, well, for sure, some of these uh, well are generated micro by microbes themselves by degrading the organic the organic compounds. Like for exa example, cellulose come from the degradation of wood, or but some compounds are actually produced by plants and released in the soil, not just by microbes. So for example, hydroxy, these 
hydroxyproline here, which is a, um, a like it's similar to the amino acid proline, but it's actually a, a compound that is a, a common exudate of plant roots. So it's a mixture of things that maybe can be introduced in the environment. And now it's not the case, but if you think about compounds that contain nitrogen or, or phosphorus, they can be uh, fertilizers, so are, for example, introduced. But some of them are produced by microbes themselves, and some of them are produced by plants. Um, and yeah, some, someone actually does mass spec, not us. <laughs> and try to see, uh, try to understand what's what's in the soil but yeah thank you for uh, the question so if there aren't uh, any question, uh, other questions maybe i'll um, i'll start uh, showing you the results so in the next few slides you will see a bunch of plots that look like this one in which we have the number of supplied carbon sources on the x axis and the richness measured as the number of bacterial species on the y-axis. And here, this green line that appears, it's the bound to richness that comes from the prediction from competitive exclusion. And I will start by showing you the results of single resource communities. So those communities are supported by just one source of carbon. And um, so each dot, it, uh, that as a color corresponds, the, each color corresponds to a particular carbon source. And um, so the first observation that we see is that uh, um, each uh, single resource can support a multi species community with an average richness of about 22 species. But the other thing that is quite uh, uh, relevant is that there is a quite large variability around this mean with some resources like uh, uh, these organic acids and this hydroxyproline that I was mentioning, uh, supporting about a dozen of species, while other resources like sorbitol and cellulose supporting up to 40 species. And the fact that uh, single resources support multi-species community is not a, a new result, but we could show it for many resources. And since in our, in our growth media, they are quite homogeneous. We think that um, the main process that is going on here is cross-feeding. I will tell you more about this later. But let me go on uh, with these plots. So now we saw these quite diverse communities and we thought, okay, now as soon as we introduce another resource, we will see a rapid uh, increase uh, in diversity. And we actually started making some, guess, some guesses. How can we predict the richness in two resources uh, if we know the richness in the single resources? So now I'm just showing you a couple of examples of these predictions that we made at the beginning. And let's say that we have, uh, uh, now I'm showing you an example with glucose and proline again, and, uh, but I will refer to them to the, with the red and the blue compound, which is the thing that counts here. So let's say that uh, in glucose, we have 20, uh, the, the red compound, we have 24 species and in proline, we have 11 species. And um, what happens when we mix them? Well, we might imagine that uh, uh, we can find all the species that we found in the two communities, in the new community. And if there are some shared species, then this is the union of the two communities. And with our data, we predicted that uh, in, the, in the red and blue, uh, uh, community will find uh, about 30 species. But you might also think that maybe there is more niche overlap uh, and uh, the union is quite a high number. So maybe uh, the, the, the richness that we might see corresponds to the maximum richness that we saw in the two constituent symbols. Well, but the thing that was quite that we found is that uh, um, when we measure the richness in the red plus blue, we found that there were, there were about 16 species, which is much lower than the prediction that I just told you. And actually is much more similar to the mean of the constituent singles. And um, this is quite difficult to explain if you think about it. And we thought, yeah, maybe this is an exception, but it's not like this because when this is actually the rule for two resource communities. And indeed, this, let's say that the richness in two resource communities is, approx is well approximated by, by the average richness of constituent singles. And this plot, maybe it's a bit cramped, but what this is just showing you the richness in single communities and, uh, and the richness in two resources with lines that connect the constituent singles to the uh, uh, respective pairs. 
And by R, you can see that all the lines tend to, uh, the majority of the lines tend to converge in the middle. Well, now, um, as a result, when, you, when we plot the 24 combinations of two resources in our, in our uh, plot, we, we realize that adding a second resource does not significantly increase community richness. So now what happened when we, uh, when we started measuring the richness in all the other combinations? Well, what jumps to the eye is that the community diversity increased only modestly with the number of additional resources. But the thing that is most striking is that the increase is linear. And uh, it also uh, happens at a constant rate of about one species for each new resource that we add. And when we look at this pattern, we were quite puzzled because we couldn't understand what was going on. But we started um, to see the light at the end of the tunnel when actually we started to dig deeper into, uh, let's say, the composition and the structure of single resources. So maybe, I don't know, Jakub uh, and Silvia, do you think that this is a good time to stop again and to see whether there are other questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see if somebody raises their hand. Yes, we have a question uh, from Ankit. Please, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, hi, Martina. Hi. So, like, this might be a very naive question, but like do the res like do we assume that the resources don't affect each other and like there are no direct interactions between like even the bacteria or you mean like chemically if in the in the solution the resources might change yeah uh, well i don't think so these are quite uh, I, these are not reactive compounds so they, they are in the solution and i they, you mean they might you mean they might break uh, due to the solution i don't really think so but okay but yeah maybe i don't know if i answered your question there is another question from tomaso please you can unmute yourself uh, yes hi martina thank you very much hi. for the call i hope my question makes sense maybe it makes more sense in the end so well if so please tell me um do, is there a measure of kind of similarity between the 16 resources you selected I'm, I'm not uh, a chemistry person, so, but is there a measure on, like, are some resources more similar to the other than others? Are they kind of clusterable? And if so, do you see results being affected by these? So this is a, this is a good question first, and uh, I think I will come to that later. But okay. if I, in the end, I don't fully answer your question, we can resume the discussion. But yeah, I mentioned some of these uh, later in, um, that has to do with the metabolites that you can get from these resources. But we can discuss more later if you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomata. Um, there is actually another question if you want to answer another from Benjamin. Sure. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. OK, so um, if I understood correctly, you across these experiments the carbon concentration in the solution is constant this is how yeah. you assure that these these are commensurate in some sense yeah so yes exactly so the carbon uh, concert, uh, sorry concentration does not increase which means that when you provide for example two compounds you have half of them compared to single resources and in 16 resources you have one sixteenth of that okay so but just my, my question would be, is this sufficient to, to say that these, that the different experiments are commensurate? Because one concern that I would, one could bring up is that uh, some compounds, even though they, they may provide as much carbon as the other, they, they may be harder to metabolize for whatever reason, right? Yeah, no, no, this is a fair concern. Uh, one thing that I can tell you is that, for example, I don't think well, I don't go too much into the composition in this talk, but I can tell you that, for example, in 60 resources, we still have uh, some microbes that are known, for example, to consume uh, cellulose. And uh, which doesn't mean that they necessarily, con they, for example, which it, I, I'm taking as example cellulose. And this doesn't mean that they are necessarily metabol metabolizing cellulose, but you can take it as, let's say, as a um, 
a, a, an observation that could make sure that you're not losing too many species because some compounds are not uh, completely usable. But yeah, this is a possible concern. And I can tell you that I did a pilot study in which I, instead of keeping constant, the concentration actually increased it. But what I, what I saw and other people in my labs usually see when we increase the concentration, that is usually we increase the strength of interactions and we tend to lose species. And I don't know if this answered all your questions, but yeah, these are possible concerns and we kind of address them, but they, let's say every, every question that, that has to do with concentration is actually very interesting. And in these, you can imagine another axis, not just the number of resources, but also the concentration. And for sure, these are all, there can be interactions between the amount of resource, the number of resources and the concentration. We didn't address this here, but it's certainly a, possible follow-up question. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think you can resume. There are no more questions. Okay, great. So as I was telling before, uh, we, uh, let's say, we went back to single resource communities and tried to understand more of what we see. For example, we started to try to understand why we see so much variability in single resources. And we think that this has to do with uh, cross-feeding. Well, and cross-feeding uh, is linked to the microbial metabolism. And here I'm just showing you, well, this is a, a zoom in in a cell, and this is a simplified map of microbial metabolism in which I'm just showing, showing the uh, central metabolic pathway. So some of you might recognize the glycolytic uh, reactions and the TCA reactions here. But one, and these maps can, are, can be found in the online and uh, there is a nice database, the CAG database in which you can actually, that you can scrape and obtain all these maps that are much more complex than the one that I'm presenting here. But this is just for, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that some of the resources that we uh, provide in the media are actually intermediates of these uh, uh, central metabolic pathway. And for example, cytrate and fumarates are intermediates of the uh, central of the TCA. And while there are the, the other sugars instead, before uh, being converted into the intermediates of the central metabolic pathway, has to have to go through a series of reactions that, let's say, are meant to chop them up into small, uh, smaller metabolites that then can be uh, fed into the central metabolic pathway. This is a very simplified picture, but it's just to give you an idea that we can estimate for each resource that we provide in the media, the number of intermediates of metabolic intermediate that can be produced by a generic ensemble of bacteria. And when we plot this estimated number of metabolites um, with the richness of the single resource communities, we find that there is a nice correlation between them. And for example, I can, uh, it's evident that it's well, what we found is that, for example, in cellulose, we can, pro, uh, cellulose from cellulose bacteria can produce more metabolites. And in proportion, we found more species in this community. While, for example, from citrate, which is already an intermediate of the central metabolic pathway, microbes are supposed to produce less metabolites. And so we saw a smaller richness. So, uh, what we thought about this, well, this is quite cool because we have an, an estimate, which again, I repeat, it's an estimate, so there are errors, but still we can find a pretty nice correlation with the richness in single resources. The other thing that is quite, that is quite intuitive here is that, um, um, let's say, uh, different resources end up, uh, from different resources, microbe can, microbes can produce uh, uh, similar metabolites. And so what we did next was actually trying to understand what is the distribution of these metabolites that can pr pr be produced from all these different resources. So what we did, so we discovered that, for example, there are uh, some common metabolites that are produced starting from the majority of the resources that we produce in the media, and are these red metabolites here. And then uh, there are also rare metabolites that instead are produced starting from just a handful of resources, very few. 
And here, this is a very simplified picture of this, but these uh, uh, circles represent uh, the resources and the, and the squares and, and symbols here represent the metabolites. And intriguingly enough, the distribution of metabolites mirrors quite well the distribution of species across single resources. So here, we actually, what we did was measuring the occupancy of each species in, across single resources, which means how many, meet, how many resources a single species is found in. And uh, again, circles represent the resources, and now bugs will represent species. So also for species, we found that there are some common species that we call generalist. So these pink bugs that are found in the majority of uh, the communities supported by single resources. And then there are also uh, uh, microbes that instead are found just in few resources. So there are sort of specialists of these resources. And obviously there are also some species that are neither specialists nor generalists that are, let's say, in between four and 12 resources. And uh, we can also plot the distribution of these uh, uh, generalists and specialists across single resources so to give an idea of how the com these communities are structured. And you might notice that uh, there is this core group of generalists that are everywhere uh, in all the single resource communities. And actually, the, uh, let's say the most diverse communities, like, for example, cellulose, uh, is the community that harbor the largest number of specialists. And so from this analysis, uh, we, I think that we got two important points that I'm summarizing here. The first one is that in our experimental communities, there are always both generalist and specialist stacks. And also, given that the, the um, the distribution of metabolites and species are kind of parallel, we hypothesize that uh, maybe generalist taxa might compete for these core metabolites, those that are common across, uh, that are always found in the resources. And also generalists are always found in all, in all the resources. While specialists maybe might compete for these rare metabolites that instead are found just in few resources. And again, I can stop here if this is not clear, or maybe I can go further and we leave the questions for later. Maybe Sylvia, let me know what is best to do, also in terms of time. I think if you're near to the end, maybe you can finish and then we get all the questions. Great. Right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So again, these were the two key points that we uh, grasped from this analysis. And we thought, okay, let's try to plug them in in a lotka volterra model so, to see whether we can reproduce our experimental results. So here uh, I'm showing you the classical, um, let's say the classical uh, lotka volterra equation in which the per capita growth is a function of the maximal growth rate, uh, which is modulated by a self-inhibition term and a term that accounts for the inhibition by competitors. And I told you that we tried to uh, fit, we tried to introduce, we include in this model generalist and specialist. And we did it with, uh, by uh, modulating the growth rates. So in this model, the pool of species that can grow increases with the number of hypothetical resources that we are providing. And um, let's say that when we have just one resource, all the generalists can grow by definition and have non-zero growth rate while this, uh, there is just a group of specialists that, that can grow, the specialists for that resource, while all the others can't grow. When there are two re hypothetical resources present, then again, all generalists can grow, and just two groups of specialists can grow, while all the others have zero growth rates. And um, the other idea that I told you that you wa we wanted to implement was this idea of two resource markets, so that um, Generalists and specialists compete for different pools of resources. And we included that by implementing in the model a modular interac interaction structure. Sorry. And which means that uh, what we did in our model, the um, specialists uh, compete strongly against, against each other. And also generalists compete, compete strongly against each other. But the interaction between generalists and specialists are weaker compared to the interaction uh, within groups. And I can tell you that just by plugging in these two features in this simple Lotka Volterra model, we were re able to recapitulate our main experimental result. That is, we could see 
a linear relationship between the richness and the number of uh, available resources, which here is approximated by the number of specialist groups that could grow. And what I want to what I want to draw your attention on is the fact that also in this case the uh, rate at which uh, we increase the number of species is constant and it's about one uh, about one species for each new resource that we add. Also, the intercept is quite similar to what we found what we find in our experiments. Um, so this. This simple model, this simple exercise that we did is telling us that uh, most likely the, uh, the way that the number and the type, uh, the number of resources and the type of resources uh, uh, determines the assemble of our communities by uh, affecting what is the uh, distribution of resource strategies and the, uh, which in turn gives an idea of the distribution of metabolites. So with this, I want to just briefly summarize what we found. And it's that uh, in, uh, in single resources, uh, you can usually single uh, compounds that are provided as single resources can, uh, can always sustain a multi species community. And we think that uh, cross feeding is underlying the observed uh, uh, richness. But when we combine these resources, we found that community diversity increases more only modestly. But still, these results are telling us that both the number and the identity of the resources that we put in the, in, uh, in the environment are important drivers of microbial community diversity. And the other thing is that by, uh, look, by looking at the uh, structure of these communities in terms of generalists and specialists, we started to understand uh, the mechanism behind this pattern. And uh, with the lock double terra, uh, with just plugging in the, uh, the idea of generalist and, and specialist and lock double terra model, we were able to reproduce our experimental result. And yes, again, to conclude, I think that we found a possible link between uh, the number and the identity of resources uh, with, uh, let's say, the uh, microbial community diversity because these two characteristics of resources modulate, uh, let's say, um, on them depend cross-feeding and also the distribution of resource utilization strategies. So with that, I'm concluding and I want to thank uh, my PI, uh, Jeff Gore, and also my collaborators, Hian and Akshit, that did a lot of the work I presented today. The Gore Lab at MIT that uh, uh, provided uh, feedbacks on this project. And if you're curious, I invite you to uh, read more about this project. We have a preprint posted on BioArchive. And finally, I want to thank you for listening and for asking questions, and I'm happy to take more. OK, great. So thank you for the nice talk. I uh, clap on behalf of everyone. There is one question from the chat. Aditya asks, how many parameters were there in the Lotka Volterra fit to the data? Did you fit each interaction coefficient or just the distribution from which they are drawn? So this is not a fit. This is just what, uh, what we get from the Lotka Volterra model. And the parameter are the growth rate and the uh, matrix of interactions. So the, the fit that you see is just a line that I, it's a regression line that I do on the data. And it's the same type of regression that I can do from experimental data. OK, so there is another question from Leonora Bittleston. Hello, really nice talk. Hi. Thank you. Um, I had a question for you about if you added more complex resources. So um, cellulose is one of the most complex that you're using, right? And so if you added something like lignin or chitin, that's even more complex and sort of um, requires or promotes more cross-feeding. Do you think you would still see this linear increase or do you think then you would see a jump that's non-linear? Well, that's a good question. I tried to get to get lignin, but when I was performing the experiment, I couldn't get it from Sigma Aldrich. So I wanted, <laughs> to be completely honest, I wanted to use lig uh, lignin. And um, yes, it might be, but so, to give you an idea of uh, how how many how much I think the number of metabolites is important is that, for example, also starch is a complex molecule, but still it doesn't give the same number of species that we can get, for example, from cellulose. So, um, for sure, adding more complex compound can change the relationship, and I think that one possible. Uh, um, for example, follow-ups to these studies actually changing the pool of resources because you, for example, you can have more organic acids or let's say more 
PCA intermediates, and maybe you have you might flatten the relationship. And let's say, as you were saying, if you add more complex compound, maybe you get a, a steeper increase. So I think that uh, this is just the platform to start to understand. Okay, if I have, if I let's say I know what I have in the pool of resources, can I start to predict how the slope changes, how the intercept might change? And these are the questions that we are thinking. What well, we're we think that we can explore them at least. So thank you. This was a really, it, it was a really interesting question.